Welcome everyone to episode 18 of the What Sales and Marketing Got to Do With It podcast. My name is Gemma Adair, founder and principal marketing consultant at Riata Consultancy. This podcast aims to delve deep into the minds of sales and marketing industry leaders, uncovering what keeps them up at night, what drives their passion and how they execute successful strategies in both their personal and professional lives. I'm delighted to welcome Earl Talbot. He is a human code breaker and innovator at Creative Muscle. Great to have you, Earl. Thank you. Great to be here. Good to see you again, Gemma. Awesome. Now, I'm really excited for this one. Um, we are just, what, a week away or so before Christmas? What can I say? Um, yeah. Actually, just under a week. So, yeah. <laughs> just under a week. It's crazy. Where has this year gone? Right. It, I mean, <laughs> it, it's gone. It's gone very, very, very quickly. Um, and it, it it almost feels like time is speeding up. But yeah, um, exciting times, and and definitely looking forward to twenty twenty four. Perfect, perfect. So, please introduce who you are and what you do. Yeah. So. A human code breaker and innovator at Creative Muscles. So really the, the closest thing that I can explain what I do is a little bit like a, a coach, but more interventions because I've got a background in NLP. I'm an NLP master trainer and I use the NLP skills to help people back into realignment. And I can explain a little bit more of that during the course of the podcast. Um, and um so I, I work with individuals, I work with teams, I run workshops, I run retreats. So it's all around personal development, whatever the context. Mainly I work with um, people who want to shift out the professional world that are no longer satisfied, they're unfulfilled, feeling that it's um, quite meaningless for them or, or in a scenario where they're, they're in burnout or people who have just gone on, on, on the solopreneurship journey who are struggling a little bit because it takes a very different mindset. It, it's a very different approach to business when you're running everything yourself as a solopreneur. So that's definitely one of the areas where um, it's probably about a 60-40 split of my clients. Some are professionals and some are solopreneurs already. So yeah, that, that's kind of what I do in a nutshell. Awesome. Oh, we're going to delve deep into that <laughs> later on, I'm sure. Um, so your, so coaching is, is current and your background is, is in sort of sales. Take us like when and where did you start your sales journey? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Um, and it depends on how we define sales because everyone says sales is, is an umbrella word, but there's different types of sales. So there's transactional sales there's consultative sales there's um you know very basic I, I would say that's not even sales it's almost like order takering order order taking so um my my background originally started in Marks and Spencer's um selling um suits uh -huh. uh, to, uh selling I worked in a suits department selling suits and I went into a job at a company called Hayes Information Management. And I went in as a customer service advisor and quickly worked out that actually that didn't work well for me, as in I could work as hard as everybody else or harder, which was actually happening. I was working harder than everybody else, but I was still getting the same money. And I saw an advert within the organization for a sales jobs, a sales job, and I, I decided I went for that job. And it was, it was selling magnetic media um to corporate so it was it was b2b and it it just felt right it it just helped me use my skills of communication and the the thing that i loved about sales is what you put in is what you get out of it so the more effort you put in and if you've got a strategy and you do the work then you get paid commission I, I did that for a short while um i went for another few jobs and then i got into the internet 
and that's when my sales career really took off um, at a company called Pipex Internet. It, well, it went through different name changes. And um, and and that's where I really cut my teeth and, and took sales very seriously and started to um, invest in time and reading books and, you know, absorb the sales training and really hone, hone my techniques. And that carried on up until um, 20... 21 yeah so a few years back yeah awesome and my next question would be have you faced any challenges along your sales journey yeah I, I think the, the biggest thing is sales is always challenging you know because you're only as good as your last month um or depending on how your targets are set or you could be as good as your last quarter there's always ways that you've got to be reinventing yourself or repositioning your organization to your customer to kind of keep it fresh and clean, right. keep the, the um, competitors at bay. So that there's a, a, there's a number of different ways that that can be done. Um, and it depends on what type of salesperson you are. So if you're a new business or account management, if you're a new business, then you need to find, let's say more, hunting grounds to go and find those clients because at a certain point you're going to exhaust those hunting grounds so it's like okay what's another list of um company organizations target markets that you're going to go after so i think for me the challenges have always been keeping the um keeping the relationship fresh and new keeping the competition at bay um but the, always the biggest challenge has been for me is there's what I used to call the anti-sales department. Mm, and what is that? Yeah. So <laughs> it, it's, it's not, it's not a particular department. It's a collective, <laughs> it's a collective of departments that look at salespeople in a certain light. Okay. And and some, sometimes that's justified, but sometimes it's not, but that's certain light that they would look at salespeople, you know, they are, they, they get, paid well they get out and do lunches they don't do any work they're always asking everybody else to do anything they're incompetent blah 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 they rip out customers you know all all of those kind of thoughts and so when you go as a salesperson go to one of those people in a department to get something done what you'll typically get is some sort of pushback or resistance so trying to get a solution together trying to get a problem resolved or whatever it is that's where you start to get the resistance of those people who kind of just think, yeah, sales, they're just overrated, overpaid idiots, <laughs> for one of <laughs> that way. So, so that would that would always be um a challenge. Another big one that is if you get a really bad manager, and this isn't this that's not unique to sales. I think that's unique to anyone. Um, if you get a really bad manager who doesn't know what you want to do, but with sales, that what happens is that you lose revenue, you lose, you might lose accounts, you might lose sales. And then you've got to make that up in some way, shape or form, because you've got a target to it at the end mm. of the month. And just a few poor decisions or bad management or, or not kind of implementing a good strategy. All you need is a few weeks for that. And that's going to affect you for months. And, mm. and, and that's probably the biggest challenge that you can overcome. Right. A that's a, I think that's that's pretty big, that that sort of challenge and trying to um, pivot and trying to kind of understand that whole dynamic and that environment and, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, absolutely. Which we'll, we'll probably touch upon um, later. Is there an area of sales that you like the most and why? And then the other question would be, is there an area of sales that you like the least and why? Yeah, so coming back to those different sales um, roles, I, I could say, or, or different types of sales. So tactical is 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 really, a, or transactional is is really when it's just it's usually low value, low value mm -hmm. sales or item. It can still be B two B. Sometimes it can be B two C, where people know what they want and they will come and try and place an order with you. 
you know, so it's kind of like, it's not consultative. There isn't really a solution in place. It's usually kind of like a simple product or service and people kind of know they want it and they just maybe ask a few questions, need some clarification and then they usually buy. So it's not even really people buy people unless you're being a bit of an idiot in that situation. Um, what I really love is the cell cycle in a consultative cell and fixing problems and looking at what that problem is and understanding why that's a problem for that particular client and seeing it from the client's position and where we work and collaborate together to solve this problem. And, and that's the that's one of the, the things that I enjoyed the most in sales, which is the way the way that often if you if you go and look at a video or an image of sales you'll see kind of one person sitting on this side of the table one person sitting on that side of the table and this person's kind of like selling or shaking hands or, or whatever it is the the image and the metaphor for me is when we're both on the same side of the table yeah you and the customer on the same side of the table and you're looking at things together and you're or you're up at the whiteboard or or whatever it is and you are solving this together and <clears throat> That's a bit that I really enjoy. It's when we're in sync in working towards a common cause. The bit I don't like um, is the almost opposite of that, which is you're trying to sell to a customer. So the, the, that example I've just given you, you're not trying to sell to the customer. We are trying to solve this problem and add the value that you need. So we are collaborating and working on that and innovating together. The flip side of that is when you're when you're trying to sell to the customer or the customer feels like you're trying to sell to them. So you almost in this in this game and this engagement of I'm the customer's trying not to tell you what they want to tell you. So they're not telling you the budget, they're not giving you all the information, they're not telling you who, who all the key decision makers are because they feel in some way, shape, or form that you're going to try and fleece them or take advantage or whatever. So they don't feel safe or don't feel trusted. So then you have this thing where they need your solution or, or a similar solution you're trying to get the information to make sure it's the best solution and what you're getting is a level of hostility or resistance in working with you and in that way they're they're, they're particularly you know pretty much working against you um, and then the extreme of that is when you have a hostile customer who they're a customer existing customer and you know they want to leave your company but their manager or you know just because of the nature of the services that you've provided to each other it's very difficult for them to to remove themselves from your organization because the the solution is so intricate so those are the, those are the ones that it, it's quite taxing and I don't really enjoy right you mentioned you mentioned earlier on some of the misconceptions that people have about sort of sales yeah. Is there any any additional ones that you'd like to add to that, perhaps from either an internal or an external perspective? Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I think there's a few core things that, that really stand out. Um, and the, the first one is not trusting salespeople. Salespeople are, you know, they they're always trying to manipulate. They're always trying to um, get one over on on you, and 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 that's the first thing. And not to say that doesn't happen. It does happen. There are salespeople who take advantage of people and customers, and and well, actually, there comes a point where at that end of the spectrum, they're not really salespeople. They are, you know, effectively con people. At the lower end, you could say that they're all the takers, mm. and that that's not that's not necessarily a negative connotation. But there are people that they think they're in sales, but actually they're just taking orders. So there isn't anything in terms of their approach or whatever. As long as they're nice and have a friendly smile, it's kind of it's a bit like going to almost like going to a checkout till, and it's kind of like actually you know you you've already selected the items, you know what you're buying. <laughs> and that's it right yeah. um <clears throat> which was different for when I was working at Marks and Spencer's because you would have to sell them this the suit you know what's the suit why this one what's the texture so on and so forth so <clears throat> really it's about how do you 
get somebody to understand that what you're trying to do is meet a need with a solution or a product or service that you've got. That's what you're trying to do with sales. And for you to do, for me to do that, if I'm trying to get you, if let's say for example, you want to buy a car and I'm like, okay, so Gemma, what, what type of car would you like? Tell me a little bit about, you know, your, your situation. Where do you go to? Where do you come from? You know, how much budget have you got? You know, it, it seems invasive, but actually what I'm trying to do is make a, a, a recommendations for you that not only just meet your short-term needs, but can meet your longer-term needs and the things that you don't think about. So for example, I say to you, okay, this car is going to be good. It's a, it's a small little car, it's, you know, it's going to suit you just fine. And then you say, well, actually, but every now and again, I, I you know, go camping and I need some space in the back and I bring the dogs. It's like, oh, right, if I miss that, then you're going to have challenges on those occasions when you do those things. Yeah. So it's really important that I get as much information as possible. And the key thing is about not moving it, using it against you. So I think the, the key thing is, I think organizations can do a better job of helping people understand internally what, what salespeople do um, and create a culture and an environment and put systems and processes where salespeople can't fleece their customers. Yes, it's about making lots of um, money and profit, but not at the expense of the customer, it's got to be a win-win solution. If it's not being a win-win solution, then at some point, somebody's got a bad, bad taste in their mouth, they side of the organization, because now we're not making us enough profit, or it's going to be the customer. And the, the issue there becomes is, the customer may not know what your profit profitability is, but they will know that they're not getting value, and they're not going to hang around. So it's, it's really about the organization really doing that externally you can't really do much about that human beings have always got an opinion about something and there's always going to be people be people that don't like sales people <laughs> that's a good that's a good one I'm a firm believer um in mm. sales and marketing alignment what's your thoughts about that yeah and and you know I, I th we've had this discussion before and sales and marketing they're they're, they're two sides of the same coin um you 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 don't have one without the other and some people are like well yeah my company hasn't got a marketing department or my company hasn't got a sales department or but if you don't have a sales department then your marketing people are doing the sales and if you don't have a marketing department your sales people are doing the marketing <laughs> and it, it's just recognizing that and again it's, it's some of the definitions or the nuances between the two but the way that I see it is the marketing is ideally the strategy. It, it's kind of underpinning of strategy, how we go to market, we, which is kind of like the whole marketing thing. This is how we're going to market and what's the mm. campaign look like, whatever it is. And sales are the kind of the troops that go and execute that in, in many ways. And yes, there's overlap. So the marketing function can um be running the campaigns and making sure they're in the right places and whatever it is and they don't do it in isolation it's not like marketing say sales you're going to do that they get the information and feedback from the sales department and say well what's working what's not working where are you seeing this happening whatever it is but they also do their own market research hopefully and they see what the trends are and everything else and so they help inform sales and say look these are the trends that we're seeing these are the things that are happening so these are the areas that we're doing. So you have that real collaboration of the, the almost strategic and then the tactical of the sales going in. And that's not to say that there isn't strategy within sales. It's just that the overarching strategy should be coming from the organization, but that's really managed by the marketing team. But if you don't have one or the other, which some organizations I know haven't got both, especially if they're smaller, then all you're saying is you've got these people doing both, which isn't optimal. But I understand if it's a smaller organization, then you might have a person or a couple of people that are kind of doing both. So yeah, they, they definitely are hand in hand. Hand in hand, that trusted relationship. I think you can't, yeah, you, you we both, marketing needs sales and sales need marketing. It's kind yeah. of like, it's a... It's a yeah, it's uh, it's a very important. I think they're they're very they're 
two of the quite important functions within an organization um and it's critical because they you know help and drive sort of help with the bottom line and revenue and opportunities and leads and all sorts of things so it's um yeah loved your your take on that um yeah and and you know in 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 many respects other than the actual underlying service and product it's probably the lifeblood i mean all, all parts are important but if you if you're not bringing the money in you know it you're, you're gonna die it's kind of like you you bring the oxygen in in a way you're you're bringing in, in the money and so for example finance is really important as well because finance means that you know they go out and collect the money and everything else but you can solve those problems a little bit more over time you can you can you know um make an agreement to pay the bank later and everything else but if you're not doing the sales up the front in the front end yeah that's the quickest way to to potentially kill a, co a, a company so that's why it's really important and why so much pressure is on there but why good sales people get paid so well because when they're doing it well you know actually the, the best sales people you, you probably have the Pareto's law of 20 percent of the of the the real business is done by 20 percent of the or 20 percent of the revenue so eight percent of the revenue is done by 20 percent of the, the the best sales people um which, which is kind of what i've seen typically mm. and it depends on how small or how big the, the sales teams are and yeah it that, that gets thrown into the mix as well <laughs> yeah the, the one thing i don't I, i've never really understood with my view of sales and marketing is why you have certain organizations which are set up where they're they're clashing against each other mm -hmm. um or, or you kind of have this and and this is where i do agree with some sales people can just be really arrogant and and snooty of you know the salesperson just kind of like just do what i tell you to do um and and not trusting that the marketing person knows their job or whatever. And don't get me wrong, incompetence is is in any organization. But if somebody has been doing something for a while and they can demonstrate their their value, just trust them to do their job. And and the yeah. same thing with salespeople. It's kind of like, yeah, you know, it's a little bit difficult with salespeople because usually the number them hitting the number means that you can see that they can do the job that said there are instances where order takers who may just be at the right place at the right time and that's worked out well for them they can still hit their number even though they're not doing any strategic proactive um consultative selling either so mm. you know, it, it, it can work both ways definitely definitely so what does a day in the life of Earl look like? So, yeah, so it's, it's interesting. <laughs> so I've made that transition, right? So I still do sales and everybody does sales, especially solopreneurs. And that's one of the areas that I do help them. But my way of looking at it was I do sales without selling. Um, because when I got into sales, especially when I was at Hayes, I was in a room, I was in a, a big room of probably about 30 to 40 salespeople. And I was the only person of colour in that room. Okay. So not a lot of people looked at me, looked like me or, or came from my demographic. Mm. And and equally, most of the customers that I were in service was in the square mile. So they were in London, in the city. And again, most of my customers didn't look like me and weren't from the same demographic. So I kind of had to find my own way of, of selling. And, and first of all, that was building relationships and trust. And it, it was really simple for me, which is if I say I'm going to do something, I do it, I get it done. And if I can't do it, I'll tell you I can't do it. Because that's one of the biggest gripes that people have with salespeople, which is they say they're going to do it mm. and they're going to do this, that and the other, and then they don't do it. And it's like, okay, then so the trust is broken. Um, So the, the you know, everybody's still say, selling. And one of the things that I help my clients with now is with sales. But the thing that really spoke to me, and I, I talked about this earlier, which is the problem-solving element of it. And that's 
really what brings me to life and and comes kind of speaks to my human code breaking so with my background in nlp what i do now is i help clients either through one-to-ones or my program the retreats are slightly different because I don't really do. I, I just set up the retreat and people just kind of relax and whatever because well being <laughs> is, is absolutely important, core value of mine. But the main thing for me is using my skills of NLP to really figure out what's the what the issue is happening with with people. So I look for misalignment. So I'm not trying to say this is what you should do. This is what it looks like to be successful. I elicit that information. And I help that person to reorganize that way to see that they're aligned, they are congruent in what it is. So that's either through the language or that's through the behaviors or that's through the beliefs and values um, or even their environment. You know, so, for example, if you're if you're saying, oh, I want to get healthy, then actually the environment that you might want to be in is an environment where there's lots of healthy people training like a gym or, or something like that. You wouldn't want to find yourself maybe in somewhere like a McDonald's or something like that. So it's kind of like, <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, if you're saying that you want to be this, but you're in that environment, then that's not going to work for you. Or if you say that, you know, you want to be healthy, then eating donuts as a behavior that isn't good for you. Yeah. Or, you know, so it, it's looking for those misalignments. And a lot of that is in our subconscious and our subconscious tends to be our blind spot. And we can't see that for ourselves. And that's why you need someone like a coach or a human code breaker um, to figure that out and, and break down what that code looks like. And the reason why I make the distinction between a coach and a human code breaker, because my style isn't like classical coaching, um, classical coaching of just asking questions or whatever it is. Actually, what I do is I create transformation experiences by using helping people use their imagination and eliciting that information from them so it's yeah it's a it's a different experience nice and just just for people <laughs> knowledge and i like what oh, okay, does NLP yeah. stand for and and on what is it yeah so um neuro-linguistic programming um neuro being the being your neurology that's your nervous system so how you experience things you're through your senses through your sight sound but you're you know externally how you interact with the world but also internally how does that feel for you what does that feel like so even when we're describing our emotions anger or sad or whatever it is really understanding what that experience is for that person so that's the that's the neuro side the linguistics is your language um and usually your there's there are patterns in your language and one of the things that I do often with my clients is I'm looking out for those language patterns so what is it that they're not saying as much as what are they saying mm. or what's the conflict in in you know what what they're saying even something simple when somebody says you know when you're trying to do this thing but they're talking about themselves right so mm. you, you know when you're trying to get fit, you go to the gym and whatever it is. Instead of saying, when I'm trying to get fit, I go to the gym. So just even noticing that whether they're associated or disassociated. Right. Yeah. So like those that. are the types of things of, of you see in the language patterns that, okay, so you're disassociated. So you're disassociated. Potentially, you can't see yourself doing that. Mm. You're saying other people, you're talking about other people. So now you're looking at those other people, but the tip then or the trick as a human code breaker is to get them to be associated now see yourself doing it okay what does that look like what does that feel like and that's what i'm saying you you elicit those feelings those emotions those thoughts those images and make sure that they're in alignment and check the ecology um so the linguistics is really gives a, a big indication of what's what's the going on inside and and how you're representing that world aside and the programming is how we work so there's an order in how we work and and that will be different for everybody um but society means that quite quite often there are some key patterns that follow it because of the way that we go to school the way that we get raised the way that society says 
you should go and get a job and everything else and and get you know married and have 2.4 kids with a white picket <laughs> fence and and you know whatever dream it is that they're trying to sell us but what I found is at a certain time a point in time it's not an age thing but it's, there's a certain point in time that people tend to wake up and say this isn't what I signed up for really mm. this isn't this isn't feeding this isn't feeding my me this isn't feeding my soul this isn't what I want for my life um <clears throat> but then they don't know how to get off those train tracks of where 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 society is is pushing them to they don't even have the, the the vision or the imagination to say it could be this or that could be that so then they just carry on trodling along and, and doing what they've always done because they just haven't figured out how to get it and and that's one of the things that I, I definitely help my clients with like what what could it be and really get that that information out and how could this work and what skills would you need to learn or develop or lean into a master yeah Oh, awesome. Which brings me to the question on how you could say, how do you help yourself in terms of how you show up? So work-life balance, how do you create um, that balance between home and work and, and what you do and showing up for, you know, your clients versus showing up for you? Yeah, it, it, it's it's an interesting one. And, and the work-life balance thing, it's 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 something that I, I think it's a it's a bit of a myth um and the way that I do it is again an NLP term is what we call chunking up mm. and chunking up is is if you you take something and then you you look at the larger the the bigger picture of that thing so um if you if you look at work what is work and what's the purpose of work? And actually the, the purpose of work is so you can live a good life, generally speaking, right? But how much time work, te work takes up and depending on what type of job that you've got, which can be very stressful, take up a lot of time, toxic, toxic culture, you know, you've got a bad boss and everything else that actually you get this divide of this is work and outside of work, I've got nothing. I, there's, there's nothing I want to do with that thing of work. And then you squeeze your life into the weekends or the evenings and two weeks holiday a year or four mm. weeks holiday a year, whatever it is. So your life is squeezed outside of that. And for me, the bigger frame is actually, you know, instead of living to work, we work to live so yes. instead of your focus being okay what's my job you know I'm going to spend four years training to be a lawyer or a doctor or seven years to be a doctor whatever it is and then I'm going to do this and then I'm going to be at this level and earn lots of money but guess what I'm not seeing my family I'm not seeing my children mm -hmm. I have to take my laptop on work and whatever it is it's about designing the life that you want yeah and reverse engineering it into that and then what happens so for me my work doesn't seem like work for me so I don't work at nine to five I kind of work the times that I can work and what, what I want to work so I design it actually my my working day kind of starts from 10 because you know that's how I want it that's how I designed it mm -hmm. but it can go into the evening it doesn't mean that I can't start earlier but typically <clears throat> that's when it starts but the work that I like doing is fulfilling and rewarding so that's what the balance is. It's, it's kind of like, yes, I'm in, you know, my office now and this is where I tend to work and everything else. But it's kind of like, how do you, the balance is as much as possible, how do you integrate work and life? That's the balance. How can you integrate the two? So I'm able to use my gifts and skills and get fulfilled at work and also do that in my life. And that's the integration of, of work-life balance. So for me, coming back to your question, I create some rituals in the things that I do in the morning, whether that's meditation, I go for walks. Um, you know, I'll hang out with people, have virtual coffee, so it doesn't always feel like, you know, I'm I'm working. I 
autonomy is really important to me so I don't really like to have a boss that I answer to um don't get me wrong I've had some really excellent managers in the past and that's worked really well but um typically within the organization having to request when you want holiday time or if you want to pick your child up from school or take the car to the garage or all those things and you know you've got somebody who's kind of like all right then just be quick about it you know you don't need that it's it's like you're still being treated <laughs> like a child or something um yeah. so those are environments and, th- and that's another reason why I loved sales because out of all of the roles from coming from customer service into sales it's kind of like you had more autonomy to go out and just do your thing and not necessarily that you're taking the mickey with it you're just you're just doing what you need to do to get the job done and 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 people aren't necessarily looking over your shoulder so for me that that's the main thing but you do also need to run it like a business in terms of business processes operations um build your pipeline um and make sure that your product and services is fit for purpose for your clientele Perfect. I think there was a lot of nuggets in there. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to listen back myself on, on the podcast, I think, a few times <laughs> for that. Um, and I'm sure other people will do. Which brings me to, to sales again. If a young person yeah. wanted to get into sales or perhaps someone just wanted to try something different, go down a, a sales route, um, what advice would you give them? So I'm I'm gonna actually go back to the last question, which is the question I'd say is what life what life do you want? And and that's one of the key things. And what do what does that look like? And <clears throat> one of the things that a lot of people said to me when I got into sales is I could never do that. I could never do that. I could never do that. Because they don't feel that they could handle the pressure. But I would look at some of those people, especially technical pre-sales people who would have to do, you know, design a solution and, and produce it in a certain amount of time. They would also have pressure. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So it wasn't that they couldn't do set sales. They couldn't work with the perception of the sales. So, or, or what they thought sales is. So if somebody wanted to go into sales, I would I, I'd beg the question, why? Mm. and figure out why they want to go into sales um because i think anybody sales is one of those things it's a bit like um what um stock markets uh people traders used to be like they they would get people that kind of had that real world experience kind of a bit bullshit pushy you know and again this is why sales kind of got a bad press but you didn't really need qualifications to go into sales. They just wanted somebody who could do the job and the qualified people aren't necessarily the people that can do the job. You know, so it's not about having a degree. It's just a case of having that tenacity, hard work, being able to, to deal with failures and everything else. Um, but once you are aligned with why you want to go into sales and the biggest reason why I could say you could want to go into sales is to ensure that you can maximize the amount of money that you can earn and you are in control of that, but you've got to work hard for it. So the way that I would say is if you're going to go into sales, think of it as you are running your own business. That's the way that you've got to think about it. You've got to own your target. You you know, (laughs) there aren't any excuses your managers, the business aren't going to want to hear excuses. So you've got to recognize that this is going to be like running your own business. And then that becomes a question, well, why wouldn't you run your own business instead of this? Just to test it, right? Not to say that they should run their own business. And that's when you can start to figure out, okay, well, but I still like working with people. I still like working in the departments and everything else. Okay, that's good. And then they can figure out whether sales is is for them or not. But you've got to be money orientated because it does come with the pressure it does come with the responsibility and so it's got to be worth your while so that's that's one of the key things I think what helped me once you can get over the money thing and you just get deeper into solving problems which is why I kind of went into the human code breaking element and started to learn more and more about NLP it wasn't even so much about the money I'm like wow the bigger the problem, the bigger the reward. 
that's the way that I started to look at it. It was kind of like, okay, this customer's come in with this big problem. They want to integrate all these systems. They've got um, offices all over the world and we need to get a system that integrates all this because my background is in technology. It's a big problem. The bigger the problem, it's going to cost more. And 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 that's, you know, great because then I'm going to get more commission. So I'd, re- I'd, I'd work that out but I will just go over and look for those problems that will make that. How 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 deep is that problem really? Don't just do it at the surface levels. Go as deep as possible. Wow, gotcha, gotcha. Oh, yeah. There's a lot in that. Um, so if you are looking to get into sales, yeah, um, that's a lot of good advice to kind of like just understand why you want to get into it. You know, what's your Unders- re- yeah? Understand and and start to observe start to observe um, people in sales positions. So even if you go into a shop and, you know, you, you're, you're trying to buy something like a computer or a stereo or something like that, and it's kind of like, you know, that people buy stereos in or, or MP3s and whatever, but, you you know, a TV or, or whatever it is that you're trying to buy and and figure out, you know, what are they, what are they saying? What aren't they saying? What are the questions that they are asking? And the last thing is, like, could I do a better job than that if I was a little bit more curious and I really wanted to sell this person? What would I do differently? And if you can quickly start to identify that, then, you know, you're probably on to a, a, a good starter. A winner. Yeah. Which, which brings me to the question about, you know, you talk about, we've talked about coaching, we've talked about sales. What did you want to be when you grew up? Um. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, <laughs> is is the is the short answer? Probably when I was younger, pro- probably a cowboy, just because of TV. Um, <laughs> okay. cool. you, know, you know, most Where's of the things hat? I watched on Where's TV. The hat? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, some something like a cowboy, um, or maybe a, a, like a racing car driver so th- those are the, i used to watch three things war movies which I, I, I never wanted to go to war but a cowboy or i used to watch um give my age away people like jackie stewart um in motor racing when i was growing up and then um james hunt and sales i kind of fell into sales sales are definitely definitely kind of fell into as I said it was it was more of a case of I didn't want to do customer service well I didn't want to be working hard and not being rewarded for that I wanted to be rewarded for the work and the effort that I put in and and that's why I went into sales but one thing I do recognize is even when I was in school primary school um that people would come and, and share things with me and I would just listen and, you know, one of the key things, as we know, two ways, one mouth, and they say in sales is listen more than you speak. So I was, I was very good at listening. Um, I've always been really good at listening and, and listening to detail that other people might overlook. And I think that's helped me very much in sales and also helped me with my NLP and my human code breaking stroke coaching right now but yeah I'm not sure what I really wanted to be when I woke up when I grew up I've done a lot of things though I've been a DJ I've been a bouncer there's lots of different things that I've been um, in my in my time as well so Earl this is your life (laughs) where's the book where's the book (laughs) yeah yeah maybe one day (laughs) you never know (laughs) What is what is your passion in life and what drives you? Wow, big question. Um, my my passion in life is really if I can help to inspire to live, to help people live the life that they want to live, mm-hmm. and not settle for this life that's been pushed on us, um, which we've been conditioned or, or programmed to live. Um, we're we're very lucky in that we live in a society and a country where I wouldn't say the world is your oyster, but you've we've got options, we've got choices. There's things that we can do when we're not in a really deprived country. Um, although government aren't, aren't <laughs> seem to be trying to get us there, that's a different conversation. 
And um, too many people are living a life that they're not happy with. And I, I, I don't get it. I don't understand it. And they don't think that they can change anything. So really, my, my thing is about how do I empower and inspire people to live the life that they want? Because I think the more we do that as human beings, the more that we live a fulfilling life, the less we complain about things, the less that we blame others and the same to people, you know, you know, whether it's from immigrants to your neighbours to whatever it is, blaming everybody, the, the woes on of this country or the world on everybody else. It's like, actually, how can I take responsibility and live an empowered life? Because once we start to do that in a fulfilling life, it positively impacts on other people. So I'm really about trying to change the world for people to be inspired and be bold and take responsibility and empowered for living the life that they want. And yeah, that, that's that's what I, I, I wake up for every wow. day. That's awesome. Yeah, it feels like a privilege. Me, which brings me to my next question. Um, is there somebody that inspires you, whether dead or alive? Um yes um but it's not a somebody there, there, there are people but I've kind of got I've, I've got a thing where it's love the message but like the messenger mm -hmm. and and what I mean by that is I've seen it so many times and it's probably happened to me in the past where we we put people up on a pedestal and then we find out something about them and it's like, oh yeah, no, they're, they're, they're not who I thought they were. Um, and, and it happened for me um, a number of different times, but one time was with, with um, like Gandhi. Gandhi, you know, I used to love his quotes and things that he said. Then I started learning a little bit more about his background and how he thought about um, black people when he was in South Africa and everything else. I was like, oh actually I didn't know that you know reading about some some of that those things is sort of uh, um racially orientated mm. but the key thing is does that diminish the message that some of the messages that he's trying to get through so I kind of don't look at people as role models or yeah you're my source of inspiration your message and your message doesn't have to be just your words it could be the way that they live their life for example mm. to people that are true 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 to their um true to their cause so people like for me Muhammad Ali is is definitely a source of inspiration um not so much even what he did for boxing and through boxing but the fact that he had a vision that he was the greatest and he didn't say I'll be the greatest when I win 63 flight fights or when I lose my title and regain it and everything else. He just said, I'm off the bat, I'm the greatest. And then he conducted himself in that way. And, and so people who aspire to be more than their environment, aspire, aspire to be more than their circumstances, I find as a source of information, even if that's the lady up the road who mm. isn't settling for, you know, the nice job that she's got and everything else. It's like, no, I, I want to do something else. I want to be some somebody else. That can be a source of inf um, inspiration for me. Makes a lot of sense. If you could speak to your younger self. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to them? Um, My younger self. Oh, wow. Um, younger or <laughs> don't waste so much time and what I mean by that is don't waste so much time thinking about what other people think mm. doing what other people think you should do um just 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 do you just just do you mm. um yeah that that would that would be it. It's, it and I think that's been part of my wake up call which is I've I I went so I tried to become an accountant before uh -huh. I, I right so just give you a little bit of that 
And the reason why I tried to become an accountant was because I was good at memorizing numbers. So I could remember phone numbers. I, I still remember phone numbers from when I was maybe five or six years old, whatever it is. So people could say to me, oh, what's such and such a number? And I was like, oh yeah. And I'll tell them the number. So where they would need to look in their diary, I would be able to remember the number. So my parents had the, in the idea, they had the idea that I should be an accountant because I'm good with numbers. And <laughs> by the way, your dad was training to become an accountant. So yeah, you'd be a good, good candidate <laughs> to be an accountant. So I went to college and I was doing my um, course, my AAT course to become an accountant. And just through a series of events, which meant <clears throat> that I couldn't take the exam that year, which was no fault of mine, but the AAT body decided that I couldn't take the exam. I'd have to wait till next year. And I was just like, I'm, like something happened, which is, your fault you your mess up but I've mm -hmm. got to wait yeah and I thought I'm not I'm not doing it I was a bit stubborn like that but then I recognized that actually I didn't want to do accounts I did it, it it was it didn't interest me I found it boring just it wasn't me so in that time where I had space where I said I wasn't going to take that exam I, I I questioned what was I doing and why was I doing it but you know, I'd wasted, well, wasted, I'd invested up at that point, two, two and a half years in going down mm -hmm. that road because other people, I was living other people's vision for me, which, which, yeah, I'm so glad I woke up to that. So, yeah, that's definitely my message for my younger self, too, which is just do, do what's right for you. And, and that's how I raise my children. I, I don't, try to force them into anything we discuss it we debate it but ultimately the choice is theirs that's great that is lovely um where do you see yourself in five years wow where do I see myself in five years so I like variety so this is why I do retreats workshops one-to-ones I also do some sales coaching um, for for smaller organizations and I also do some consulting and I think I will continue to do that but I will start to do it from different locations and warmer climates um yeah. and 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 that's and and possibly more retreats I think is is the other key thing where um I think retreats are really interesting and profound in terms of just by people going into a place space where they're relaxed <coughs> there's no expectation excuse me there's no expectation for them to perform that they can allow and give themselves space just to be wiser and be more open so maybe integrating a little bit more of my program in retreat work is is where I see myself but I see myself pretty much doing similar things to what I'm doing now but in different locations I do have more retreats oh awesome and, and more collaborations as well because I do enjoy collaborating with people perfect now that's brilliant which you talked about retreats there when you when you go on holiday what do you like to do yeah um so it's different for me now because having family, I kind of have to do what they want to do as well. But I like I like to walk. I like to go on little mini adventures. I like to go and see different things. And, and you know, I, I can do uh, a little bit of lying on the on the beach and, and relaxing, but I do get restless. <clears throat> I like to to swim as well I, like, I love to be in the water so whether that's snorkeling scuba diving or or just swimming for for health and well-being and I do like to walk in like mountainous areas not necessarily mountain climb but kind of like hills and stuff and, and see good views and, and landscapes um yeah and that's 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 it really and just hang out and spend time with the family and have fun and 
actually watch the kids just having fun is is also good when when I'm kind of sitting by the pool or whatever it's usually because I'm just watching the kids have fun or jump in the pool with them when when they were younger like teaching them how to swim and things like that or playing games in the pool oh awesome awesome do they get they do they like pull you in go come on dad uh, my daughter who's the younger she's more like more likely to do that the boys <laughs> now my, my two boys are older they just tend to go off and do their own thing actually they're probably like go away dad <laughs> leave us alone <laughs> you're, camp- you're camping our style <laughs> nice 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 um some people love to read books podcasts you know listen sorry listen to podcasts what's what's your kind of go-to in terms of um yeah yeah so I I recognize I'm I'm somewhat neurodiverse and that includes some dyslexia um you know I'm, I'm dyslexic but I don't know what that scale looks like in, in its entirety so um so I tend to go to podcasts and audio books I do read books but I just tend to find I consume much faster when I'm listening um and I don't get as bored uh, so I've, the other element is that yeah shiny things my my attention can go pretty quickly from something else when I've just got my headphones in, I'll just listen. So, yeah, I, I like to listen to, um, there's a few ones that I, I listen to on a regular basis, High Performance Podcasts, um, Diary of a CEO, uh, Feel Better, Live More, Dr. Chatterjee. There's a few of those, but audio books as well. Um, I, tend, I tend to like to, to listen to those as well. Um and reading short articles and watching interviews like 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 the one that we're doing here. So um which it's kind of funny now, right? Because podcasts used to be just audio, but now you've got the audio video element right now and, and more people doing it on YouTube and stuff like that. So now I see myself watching those. And I suppose, you know, Ro- Joe Rogan is probably the person that really Rogan, brought, brought yeah. it to, to, to that. To the two mediums <clears throat> so yeah watching podcasts as well <laughs> is, is is yeah definitely one of the things i enjoy oh awesome awesome if you had a chance to be a superhero or have superpowers who wow. and what would they be and why um I would probably say Doctor Strange. <laughs> cool. Um, there's a lot. I used to read the comics, and there's so many superheroes um, going through my mind. But I think what why I say Doctor Strange is because I'm intrigued by magic. I love the concept of magic, and that's what he represents and and what i mean by magic is you know i'm i'm talking to you now on a computer through waves that we can't see <laughs> on a device that was in somebody's imagination at one point it didn't exist mm. that is now a physical tangible thing that i can touch in front of me and you are doing the same it's like to create something from nothing and be connected in this way that we're having this conversation like you know if you was to go bring somebody forward in time from i don't know at the 18th century they'll be like (laughs) what is this how right (laughs) and that's you know that's why i call my that's why i call my my um my business creative muscle because we're creativity is magic for me creativity is magic and creativity and innovating is magic and i see that with my clients all the time when they they kind of come in with these predicament situations mm. problems issues whatever it is and just by asking 
a few questions and pointing out a few things and yeah they can be they can transform in in minutes in absolute minutes yeah so that that that's magical for me um so yeah magic is 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 the superpower like and it's it. all encompassing it's, it's kind of like and you it's not like the hulk is strong but that's what the hulk is the hulk is strong and you know black panther is strong and fast and yeah but magic is everywhere so yeah great which brings me to my last two questions so if you had to ask the audience a question what would that be what do you want what do you want ask is most people don't ask themselves that question most people settle for what society says they should have what kind of life that they should have mm. the question that I would invite everybody what do you really what do you really want deep down what is it that you want for you and your life that would be the question that I'd, I'd ask them to ask themselves nice and do you have any final words that you would like to share yeah figure out what you want and go after it <laughs> <laughs> Ask yourself your question, what is it I want? And keep asking that question. And you know, we we we've talked, we, you know, we've we've done the um uh we've done the webinar and, and the events around networking. And, and one of the exercises, as you know, we do is knowing your why. Um and knowing figuring out what it is that you want is is the surface level, which is which is brilliant. But then going to those other layers of knowing why you want it is what makes it really impactful, really important. So knowing what you want and then knowing why you want it is why you're going to go after it and be consistent and be focused. And I wish more people would ask themselves those questions. What do I want and why do I want it? Keep asking the question and keep refining it and keep building it and keep going after it. There's some great final words. Thank you so much, um, Earl, for your time today. Um, I think there's a lot of great nuggets in in this podcast, and thank you so much for sharing. I always love how you turn up, so that's that's a no brainer. Um, you know, that's what I think. So keep showing up, keep turning up as you're doing, and um, look forward to 2024. Um, and have a great day rest of the week and break thank you very much and it's been an absolute pleasure and you know I, I love sharing this time with you and, and spending time and and whether that's on stage whether that's on on the course or whether that's here on on the podcast so thank you so much Emma. thanks for inviting me in, and I've really enjoyed it thank you have a good day take care you bye too. bye